before we begin, in just a few moments, we're going to go live uh, to Holy Trinity. If you're watching this on the live stream, uh, you'll see a comment field. We encourage you to put comments in, especially when you see a, a, there's a countdown timer. Um, those comments now will be able to be seen by the person leading the service. And so um, I'll hand over in just a moment. If you're on catch up uh, through YouTube, when you see the countdown timer, you may want to skip ahead. Let's jump in. Good morning, welcome to the 1045 service. I need to change that slide, it said 1030. Anyways, um, welcome to the 1045 service, glad you're here. Um, there's still loads of people outside that are making their way in. Um, and so, <laughs> let, me, uh, let me cheat, and we're gonna jump quickly to that two minute countdown. Um, let me first of all just say, if you're new with us this morning, fantastic, glad you're here. Hope you feel really welcome, really at home. Hope you connect with people quickly, and obviously it takes time to settle into a church, to know people, um, but we hope that'll happen very easily for you. Um, right now I'm gonna give us two minutes on the clock. Um, can I encourage you to chat with someone near you, something interesting from the week um, that, you, that you can share. And so you've got two minutes, and then we'll, we'll get going again. Go for it. Here's some things that you need to know. When it comes to COVID guidelines, again, what we're holding to right now um, is that we wear a mask while moving around the building and while singing and with social distancing, just try and be considerate of others. Now, if you're at the 1045 service, I realize it may feel like there isn't much space. And so if you're concerned about that, I'd encourage you perhaps to come to the 9 a.m. service as there's still some space there. If this continues to be a problem, of course, uh, we will look at adding an additional service. The picnic last Sunday was fantastic, and it was great to see people from Stack, from the 9 a.m., from the 1045, all there. 
And um, so if you missed it, um, well, it was so good, we wanna do another one. And so we're gonna have another church picnic on October 3rd. It's a bring your own picnic sort of thing. Get the date in the diary. Of course, this is weather permitting, cause come on people, this is England. Uh, but um, October 3rd, um, following, so from noon on, and so you might want to be part of that. If you're a newcomer, over these recent weeks, we've had loads of new people joining us. And so um, here's a few things you may want to be part of. Um, so let me hand over to Sharon Blair. Good morning, everybody. Are you new in the church or newish? Or you would like to find out more about who we are as a church? Then we'd like to invite you to a newcomers course which is starting on the 22nd of September, that's this coming Wednesday, at the home of Hills and Dave Rogers. All the details are on the notice sheet. Um, but at it, you'll get to meet other newbies, you'll be able to have coffee and cake, and you will meet all the staff there during those five weeks, and other ministry heads too. You'll even be able to grill the vicar, ask him all the most, not embarrassing, but the most difficult questions that you can think of um, in order to find out more about who we are as a church. Second thing I'd like to invite you newbies to is lunch on the 26th of September here at Appledore. A um, couple of home groups are getting together to provide you with food and we'd love to get to know you better in a social setting. So do let me know if you can come to either of those two things, newcomers course or lunch, starting soon. See ya, bye bye. Morning everybody, uh, quick notice from me about student lunches. Um, there will be, in the next year, nearly 30,000 students coming to Bath to study, whether at Bath Spa or Bath University. Next week is the Freshers' Week for Bath Uni, and the week after is Freshers' Week for Bath Spa. We want to be ready to welcome uh, as many students as would like to come to our church. And one of the ways we want to do that is by offering them home-cooked Sunday lunch. If this is something you think you could offer maybe once or twice in a term um, to a couple of students to come to your house and have Sunday lunch with you, um, please get in touch on the email uh, just below. Um, we'd love to hear from you. If you think you'd like to support the student ministry work a little bit uh, more formally in some other way, maybe mentoring students, maybe helping lead a student group um, or something else in the future, let me know that as well. If you're a student watching this, um, well, you are uh, really welcome and please get in touch and, uh, and we'll um, get you stuck into our church family uh, and let you know what's going on. Thanks very much, everybody. See you later. Lastly, uh, as part of the women's ministry for you ladies, uh, there's a special morning on October 2nd. Uh, coffee and cake and my wife Jo speaking about what it was like uh, to be there at the start of Arosha, to grow up as part of an Arosha community. And so um, that will be happening on October 2nd at St. Andrews. Um, tickets are available through the website. Thanks. Brilliant. As we, as we begin, um, it's good for us to just have a moment to kind of focus, to be aware of the fact that actually when we gather to worship that God is with us. And so, um, can I just give us a moment right now, just some silence, um, just to, to call to mind the fact that God is here. And so let's, let's do just that. Father, we ask that you would help other things to sort of fall away right now, that you'd help us in this time, in this space, to just co to focus on you, that as we do, that you would encourage us with a sense of your nearness and your presence. And so, Father, we ask that you would help us to worship you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship. Please remember to wear masks if you can. That would be great. Thank you. Morning, everybody. Morning, everybody. Hey, there we go. Should we stand? One, two, three, four.
who breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth, who shakes the whole earth. Father, I thank you for the, the hearts here that are hungry for you, that love you. Father, I thank you for the feeling like this place is about to just take off as people seek you. I love it. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Right.
right, right now, um, our children and youth can head off to their groups. Um, if your child is age seven or under, Ruth's crew, you want to go with them and then to help them settle in and to collect them at the end. Um, and so children and youth can head out of the main doors. And again, if your child's age seven or under, you want to go with them, help settle them in, and come back and join us. And so we'll give a moment um, for them to head out. Fantastic seeing that all those children and youth, isn't it? Okay, and so um, we'll continue now with, um, with some bits that we can pray into, but go ahead and, and give us Chris the Curate's COVID update, sort of our community update. Um, it'll come up in just a moment. That's just a slide to, uh, to make us aware. There you go. Hello, this is Chris the Curate's Congregational Catch-Up, and today I'm really pleased to be talking with Ted Litchfield. Ted, welcome to the Catch-Up. Good to be with you, Chris. Ted, um, you and the family uh, are part of the 1045 congregation at Holy Trinity, um, but away from church, you're involved in some really interesting stuff. Um, so we're particularly thinking about the charity Grow for Life. Tell us what Grow for Life does, Ted. Um, thanks, Chris. Yeah, Grow for Life is a, uh, uh, an SDH, a social therapeutic horticulture um, charity. So we're working with people who are struggling in life with anxiety, depression, loneliness. Wow, so really important stuff. And But what's the grow bit? So what do you do with people? Well, we, we first of all, we try and encourage them into gardening, to be in, uh, to work with us uh, in, a, in a community uh, of gardeners. And uh, we have a session on uh, Thursday doing that and helping other people with their gardens. And then we have a uh, training program as well which they can graduate into which is on a Tuesdays and that's a city and guilds horticulture training course great so people actually can get a qualification yeah they can uh, that is so good Ted and um, it, something exciting has been happening recently I think for you yeah that's that's right um, we've we've been looking for a home for grow for life for quite a few years and um, we've recently been offered a derelict walled garden in a village uh, near Bath which we are really excited about because it will allow us to yeah to set up a home and be on a permanent site and have workshops and our own garden so we're very very excited about that that is that is great so there's much more we could talk about grow for life you have a website I think Yes, indeed. Uh, uh, Growthlife.org.uk. Please there you go. have a look at that. There you go, folks. So how could people pray for, uh, for, for, for Grow for Life? Oh, what a great, what a lovely offer. Um, yes, I think to pray around this new chapter with the, with the wall garden, we're, we're kind of growing quite significantly at the moment with the amount of trainees that are coming in. So prayers for the trainees, for healing for them restoration and for volunteers as well we'll be looking for more volunteers to help us with this as this project moves and grows well done what a great thing to be involved with fantastic said lovely to hear about grow for life uh, and uh, people do have a look at the website so many thanks ted god bless bless Bye -bye. you Bit an honor thank you thank you i long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. This is the persecuted church, following Jesus in isolation, in secret and in danger. But together, we are the church, one faith, one hope, one body. In September, join Open Doors Live as we gather online with our persecuted brothers and sisters and pray and worship 
in churches and homes across the UK and Ireland. Hear their stories firsthand. Be challenged to pray and move to act. Grow your vision of church, deepen your faith, and dare to follow Jesus together. Gather together with your church, friends, and family, and join us online this September. Brian, we've got many people as part of our church that are connecting with that, and so you might want to as well. Um, let me invite Bryony um, to come and lead us in a time of prayer. Morning. Um, at the end of the prayers, um, I'll give us some time. If anyone has something on your heart and you want your church family to say an amen for you, then have a bit of a think about that while we do the main body of prayers, and then there'll be time at the end. Um, and if you speak fairly loudly, there's an ambient mic, so the people online will hear you as well, we think. But let's pray. Lord, thank you for this safe space. Thank you that you're here with us, that your spirit is ministering to us. And we pray that you'll open our hearts to hear your words today. We pray for the open book team at Coondown Primary School. Thank you so much that they're able to go in and speak your words and um, portray something of what it means to be a Christian in Coondown Primary School. And we pray that you will bless that ministry. We pray as well that your purpose will be fulfilled with our mission partners who are affected by COVID who aren't able to go where they were expecting to go. Um, it's a really difficult time. You feel that you're called one way, but it's not happening, and we pray that you would give them strength and resolution and comfort, and that you will continue to be able to use them. Thank you, Lord, for the amazing projects here in Bath, for the Youth of Christ Hive Project, and for Growth for Life bringing your voice into the community. We pray for the impact over this autumn with those projects, and we pray for volunteers, and we ask that you will bless all those projects working here in Bath. And Lord, we pray for the children from our church who are off to university or further education, we pray that you will bless them as they go out into the world and you will give them good friends who can help them and we pray that you will deepen their faiths and give them opportunities to serve you as they go out in the world. And we pray for those young people who are coming to Bath for the first time that you will give them the support that they need and that you will open hearts and you will enable us to help them in their journeys. We pray that we'll be open to you this week, to your comfort and to your promptings. If anyone would like to pray, please do. Father, I pray for those that are still fearful behind locked doors. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Brian, at this point, we're going to head back into a time of worship. So I'll invite the worship team up. Father, we ask right now that as we come to worship you, that you would help us to come to you with, with hearts that are ready to receive. And so 
Help us to worship you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we sing.
death could not hold you.
wonder right now, just in a, in a place of worship and prayer right now, um, if, if any of us, um, if you kind of think, I'd, I'd want some people to pray for me right now, um, I'm going to invite you just to, to put a hand up in the air, um, and then people around, maybe don't touch if we're worried about COVID, but you can stretch a hand out to them, that sort of thing, um, and let's just, let's just pray for people right now. Um, and so if you'd want to receive prayer like that, um, don't feel like you have to, but if, you, if you've got something that's burdened you and you really want prayer, um, maybe right now stick a hand in the air, um, and then I'm going to invite people just to look around, see where those hands are, and then we're going to pray. Um, Karen, do you have something you want to share? Um, just had a picture whilst we were singing of um, the desert with a very, very big black castle, kind of a bit weather-beaten, and a very small little person approaching it. And they, they want to go in, but they don't want to go in. So if that's you and you'd like prayer, then, then go for it, because it's worth getting in. Let's just, if you've got, so if you want prayer right now, put stick a hand well up in the air, okay? I'm going to invite people to look around, and if you see someone with a hand in the air right now, we're just going to pray. Um, and so let's pray um, for people from our church family. Let's pray. If you see a hand in the air, if you, be bold. If you, don't worry about it. You know, if you want prayer, stick your hand well up so people can see. You can see some hands. Look around. And that, let's just, let's just, um, just pray for someone near you. Let's pray. Father, we pray into the situations that people are facing. Father, we pray into things that are difficult, sometimes without easy answers. Father, we pray that you would bring points of breakthrough. We pray um, for times where it's clear that your spirit's at work. We pray that, um, that you would be glorified in situations that seem impossible. Father, we pray um, for some people, we pray where there's, that there would be breakthroughs regarding in health and relationships and all sorts of different things. And Father, we just we put people before you right now. So can I just invite people, continue praying for someone near you. Let's just be in a, be in a moment of prayer right now. I pray right now for people that, for some people that just need your encouragement. I pray for a sense of your spirit just coming to rest on them. Your spirit coming and just whispering somehow that it's going to be okay, that you're with them. still beautiful and it's still vibrant and it's still growing so maybe that means something to someone We're going we're gonna to continue now um, with our scripture reading, and so please feel free to take a seat. The believers share their possessions. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. 
Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you've lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You've not just lied to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who'd heard what happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, How could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband at the door are at the door and they will carry you out also. At that moment she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who had heard about these events. Brilliant. Many will know right now we're in a, in a series called Unstoppable where we're working through some passages in the book of Acts. And I just want to say, we don't skip over the hard passages. No way. In fact, instead what we do is we give them to Tim to preach. Um, on his first Sunday preaching at Holy Trinity. There you go. Yeah. Tim, can I invite you up front? Can I pray for you? Um, <laughs> Father, we put Tim before you right now. Um, Father, I pray that, uh, that you would um, help him as he opens this passage for us. I pray that, you would, um, that there would be things in this passage for us to connect with, that, um, that you'd be speaking through it. I pray that you bless Tim right now, and you bless us as we look at your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, is this, is this working, this microphone? Because it wasn't working earlier. That's working. Is it booming? I'm happy to take the handheld if it's better, but all good. Good, yes. Well, so this is my first sermon in a new church, and um, very grateful to Sean um, for giving it. I looked at the preaching rotor, I looked up the passage, and I laughed out loud. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, and started praying, which is probably not a bad thing to do. Um, it is famously one of the most challenging stories in the entire Bible. Um, and uh, here we are, Ananias and Sapphira. Um, it's challenging, and therefore, particularly this week, uh, if not every week, I do encourage you to have the Bible open in front of you so you can see what we're looking at and you can wrestle with it yourself as much as I am. Um, as we had it read, some of us, you know, joking aside, it's a tricky passage, but some of us would have, I guess, been pretty shocked by it maybe a bit worried, a bit unsettled, it feels a bit Old Testament, doesn't it? You know, you think, oh, is this kind of Jesus-ish? Should we, you know, how do we deal with this? Um, maybe some here are just feeling on the fringes of church or fringes of faith, and this story of a couple seemingly struck down for kind of keeping back a bit of their pension pot basically just confirms all of your suspicions about church. This is... Uh, essentially superstitious and the church just wants your money or else. Um, if you've had any of those feelings or those thoughts, then I want to encourage you that you're in the right place because um, we're going we're gonna to think about it and we're going to try and work out what God is saying to us through this difficult and challenging story, um, which really happened a couple of thousand years ago. Um, and so we're hoping that God will speak to us through his spirit by his word. Um, is this microphone distracting? Do I, is it kind of booming and stuff? Do I need something different? Or is it okay? We're all good. First of all, then a bit of context. Um, we've seen the last couple of weeks in Acts, if you've been here, Acts 1 and 2, uh, that this 
book of Acts of the Apostles is the second installment from Luke. The first is his gospel, all about Jesus' life and teaching and ministry, his death and resurrection. This second installment, the Acts of the Apostles, is really the continu continuation of Jesus' ministry through the Holy Spirit by his church, the building of his, of his church. Um, and he says at the beginning, uh, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, to his disciples, you're going to be my witnesses to the very ends of the earth. And he says to them at the beginning, wait for the coming of the great Holy Spirit, this gift which is going to empower you to be my witnesses. Um, and I'm looking at Sean because he's turning around with the microphone. Do you want to do this? Take out the yeah. we'll Should I turn this one off? Not only... Not only has Sean given me the hardest passage in the New Testament, he's also, you know, technological issues. Here we go. It's all to test me. So, Jesus has promised them the Holy Spirit. Um, we saw last week that amazing story of Pentecost when God himself, the Holy Spirit, is poured out on these new believers at Pentecost. And amazing stuff happens. So between chapters 2 and chapter 4, which we're in today, a few things have happened. We've had Pentecost. Pentecost leads to power. These are all going to begin with P, apart from one. It's really annoying. Um, <laughs> Pentecost leads to power. Um, the, the, the disciples are given great power. We see miracles, miraculous healing. Um, we also then see preaching. They're emboldened to preach the message of Jesus. Peter stand up, stands up in chapter 3 and declares the message of Jesus with great power. Um, that power and that um, preaching leads to growth. That does not start with P. Um, casually, Luke mentions that 3,000 were added to their number that day. Um, so power, preaching, growth, that leads to persecution. In chapter 4, Peter and Paul are chucked in prison, they're threatened. And that persecution of the apostles leads to, leads to prayer. This new body of believers cries out to God in prayer. And that gets us to the verse before our passage, if you just look at chapter 4, verse 31. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. And if you like, we go around again. They get more power. They preach more boldly. They grow more. There's more persecution later to come. That's the context. That's where we're at. So we've got these new believers gathered with the Holy Spirit given to them. And for the first time, in just chapter 5, verse 11, at the end of our reading, Luke uses this word church to describe this new group of believers. Ecclesia is the word. The first time he uses it. And it's the same word that's used to describe the Old Testament people of God. Here it's new, used to describe the new covenant people of God, these new people who have this faith in Jesus. And so the question that we're going to be thinking about today as we look at this passage is, what will this new spirit-filled community look like? What is it going to look like? What's the real deal? The spirit-filled community. We're going to see, as we look at it, the real deal of the spirit-filled community. And we're going to see, sadly, some fatal fakes. The real deal and some fatal fakes. First, the real deal. We're going to look again at verse 32. Let me read it for us. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had. So what does it look like to be the real deal, spirit-filled community? The church, first of all, is united. They were together. They, they, had, they were one in heart and mind. That is, they had the same passion and desire, and they had the same conviction, this belief in Jesus. One in heart and mind. And so it is the gift, therefore, of the Holy Spirit to bring unity to his people. A mark of the Spirit's work amongst us is togetherness. Not uniformity, not sameness, but togetherness. These, these people gathering together were, were different ethnically and economically, but they were together. The real deal, the Spirit-filled community, is together. It's united. Luke says they were united in heart and mind. They were one in heart and mind. Now, I'm the new guy here, um, so I don't know, yet know to what extent we are a united church. I trust and pray and hope that we are. But you guys can think about that. To what extent are we a spirit-filled community and therefore united together, one in heart and mind? And if we are, there's someone to pray for, for the Spirit's work amongst us. Are we a spirit-filled church in that sense, united together in heart and mind? Well, what else does the real deal look like? And this is where it actually gets challenging. Um, are you ready for this? This is challenging. It also looks like this. Radical attitudes to stuff. Radical attitudes to stuff. Did some of you, as we heard this read, I don't know if this is a familiar passage to you or not, but as you, as you read what these early Christians were like, did you think, 
they sound a bit like communists. Like living in a kind of big commune, sharing, is this, is, is this what we're meant to be doing? Should we not have any possessions that are out? What, what's going on? Is it a bit weird? Well, let's work out what's going on. Verse 32 again. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had. Now, we know that they did continue to have their own possessions, so they're not literally sharing everything they had, because actually some of them, from time to time, as we see later, sold their possessions. You can't sell something that you don't own. So they did still have their own possessions. You might be encouraged to hear. You don't have to sell everything you own. But it was their attitude to their stuff which was radical. No one claimed that, they, that they had their own possessions were their own. But it is their attitude which has changed. So what it is, it's they're saying, I've got a jumper, you're cold, have my jumper. I've got some money, you haven't got any money, have some of my money. What they were recognising with this radical attitude was that ultimately their stuff wasn't their own. It's ultimately not ours, basically. It's a radical attitude to stuff. And it could not fly, I think, more in the face of our society today. That radical attitude that these early Christians had to their stuff seems the opposite of our culture today. Um, if you think about it, we, we so often think, well, I worked hard for this stuff. Um, it, it's mine. I need it. I want it. I deserve it. Um, I've worked hard. Maybe you're retired. You have a pension. That's my pension. I worked very hard for it. And maybe when we do do kind of sharing of stuff, we invite someone around for a meal and, hey, share my food, but bring some wine to show that you're grateful. And if you don't, I might judge you. Uh, for being, you know, a little bit ungrateful. Um, that's a silly thing to say, but you get the point. It's very different from these early Christians. They're radical attitude to stuff. What's mine is yours. Radical. The spirit-filled community in Acts is radically different in its attitude to stuff. Why is that? Why is that? What would... The work of God in people, or rather not what, why would the work of God in people produce this radical attitude? I want to suggest to you that, that it is because that is how God is. God does not sit in his splendor and keep it all to himself. He created the universe simply as, a, as an expression of generous love, an overflow of his love outwards towards other people. He gave his very self, as Paul puts it in Philippians 2. You know that lovely song about Jesus in Philippians 2? He says, Jesus did not consider equality with God something to kind of be grasped onto, to hang on to, keep it to himself, but rather he made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, he humbled himself. That's what God is like. That's what Jesus is like. Jesus doesn't claim his right to ownership. In creating us, in saving us, he gives, he shares, he blesses others. And so when we, as individuals and as a church, receive him by his spirit into our body, our lives, well, it begins to produce that same radical attitude. And I hope you agree with me that it's beautiful. It is a lovely thing when we read about it. Verse 34 says there was no needy person among them. As you read that, here is the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Is that not what we're meant to pray for? Here is the Jesus manifesto being lived out by his people and it looks wonderful. I want to join it. I want to be a part of that. It should get our hearts beating as we see it. So the real deal, spirit-filled community is united, it's radical in its attitude to stuff, and it is crazily sacrificial. Verse 34 again, let me read it, where is it? There is no needy person among them, we've seen that's beautiful. How's that happen? Well, for from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, bought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. It's one thing to say, here, borrow my jumper. You're a bit cold. That's generous of me, isn't it? Or even one thing to say, do you need a tenner? It's a quite another thing to say, I'll sell my house and give the entire proceeds to the church. It's, cra it's crazy. In fact, if you did that today, possibly rightly, or we might agree with your family would go, don't do that. That's stupid. That's my inheritance. Don't do that. 
It's crazy. People would think you're stupid. But again, here is the work of the Spirit. The Spirit who is one with Jesus the Son, who not only made himself nothing, but what does Philippians 2 go on to say? He humbled himself in obedience to death, even death on a cross. Jesus does not just have a radical attitude. He's crazily sacrificial. And in fact, Paul says, doesn't he elsewhere, that the, that the cross is crazy to the world. It's foolishness, stupid. And so is the way of the cross. And that is the way of the spirit-filled community. Crazily sacrificial. It's the real deal, and I think it's quite beautiful. Before we get on to the fake, faithful fakes, um, did you notice the lovely example of the real deal that we're given just at the end of that bit of chapter 4? You get uh, Joseph, the, a Levite from Cyprus, whose nickname is Barnabas. Great name. Have you got any Barnabases here? That's surprising in a church. Next person to have a baby, call him Barnabas, if they're a boy. Um, <laughs> Barnabas, meaning, of course, son of encouragement. And I can say as a church leader, it would be very encouraging if someone sold their house and laid the proceeds at my feet. Um, be very encouraging. <laughs> but he's raised here. Um, he's, he's actually raised here as a, as a, as for two reasons. He's going to occur in the story later. He's going he's to play a big part in Paul's missionary journeys. And also um, because he's contrasted with who we're about to see, Ananias and Sapphira. You've got Barnabas, the real deal. And you've got Ananias and Sapphira, who are the faithful fakes. And that's where Luke goes next. Let's have a look at the faithful fakes. We heard the story read. read we get the story. Um, a couple in the church sell some land and bring the proceeds to the church and everyone in the church goes, wow, what a couple. Um, midweek prayer meeting. Uh, have you heard Annie and Safi? Yeah. Um, I mean, they've got that plot of land. They've had it, yeah, I know, they've had it for a while. It's gone up like that in value last year. They've sold it. They're giving everything to the church. So godly. So generous. What an example. I want to be more like Annie and Safi. And then you get Peter, and you see that he sees straight through them, through presumably some spiritual insight, and he condemns Ananias and says, how has Satan so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money? And Ananias shockingly drops down dead. And we think, well, hang on. They've been quite generous in my mind, is this not a pretty harsh judgment? Three hours later, Mrs. Sapphira comes along, continues the lie, and suffers the same judgment. And it is shocking, it's very uncomfortable to read that and hear that again, isn't it? And so we want to ask, what is the issue, and how is it relevant to us? After all, they have done more than most of us, I would imagine, in selling their house and giving quite a lot of the money. To the church. What is the issue? I think one word can sum it up, and that is hypocrisy. Now, they seem to have embezzled money somehow. Um, it seems that they kind of broke some kind of contract that they had with the, with the church, which is why Peter says you kept back part of the money, verse 3, chapter 5. But that's not the main issue. The main issue seems to be saying one thing and doing another. It is lying to the church lying to Peter, and Peter says, lying to the Holy Spirit, to God himself. They wanted the credit and the prestige of sacrificial living without the pain. They wanted to be known as big givers. Oh, Annie and Safi, so godly. Without taking that hit fully. They agreed to one thing and they did another. Their motivation wasn't ultimately helping the needy amongst them, it was boosting their own reputation. It wasn't seeking God. It was seeking the praise of others. And consistently, throughout the Bible, God hates that. Jesus, if you read Jesus talking to the Pharisees, he hates religious hypocrisy. And the Holy Spirit, we see here, hates it too. As Peter points out, quite shockingly, it's of Satan. Satan. Because hypocrisy kills the church. Why? Well, because it is the opposite of Jesus, isn't it? 
complete opposite of Jesus. It's the opposite of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is utterly generous. He is love. He is kind and giving. As we've seen, he gives of himself radically and crazily sacrificially, and there is no hint of deceit in him. And so when the Spirit works in us genuinely, that is the real deal fruit he produces in us. So to pretend or to artificially inflate to make yourself look better, that is all kinds of wrong. It's everything that Jesus is not. And I think for us, you know, this was Ananias and Sapphira 2,000 years ago. Think of us today. It's hard. In an age of social media, um, and I'm looking at this congregation, I reckon there's more social media users than the 9 o'clock one we've just done. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. In an age of social media, what is social media? What is designed for us to project an image of ourselves to the world, which is at best highly edited, and at worst a downright, li downright lie. So what do we do with the story of the fakes of, of Ananias and Sapphira? Well, I take it that we should, we should hear it as a warning. Not that God is generally in the business of striking people down. This is a highly unusual event. But it does remind us of the seriousness of sin and of religious hypocrisy in particular. That's a nice tune. <laughs> religious hypocrisy is serious, this tells us. In fact, it's satanic. It's anti-Jesus. It's a big deal. They were faithful fakes, Ananias and Sapphira. So as we finish up here in this passage, it would be easy for us to leave church this morning with the impression that we need to try a bit harder. Try not to be as hypocritical as you naturally are. Try to be a bit more like Barnabas and a bit less like Annie and Safi. And to some extent, of course, that is true. They are examples for us to follow or not follow, but... The, work of the message of Jesus and the work of the Spirit is never merely a moral one of try harder, be less hypocritical. No, the secret to spiritual growth for us this morning is to fix our eyes on Jesus. So I don't want us to leave church this morning thinking, I need to be a bit of better Christian. We need to be a better church. I want us to leave with our hearts warmed by the kindness of Jesus because that's what changes us. You see, wherever we are on the Barnabas to Ananias and Sapphira scale, Jesus is the friend of sinners. Jesus is the one who understands our weaknesses. Jesus is the one who's like us in every way, yet was without sin. And actually, that applies to maybe some here who, whether in the church or, or online, or you, you feel that you're kind of on the outside or the fringes of church, or maybe firmly on the outside. And maybe you are so disillusioned with Christian hypocrisy, the big scandals of mega pastors, church, mega church pastors, and sexual abuse, or the smaller but no less significant hypocrisy of a Christian in your family or in your friendship circle. And you look at it and you think, that stinks. I want nothing to do with that church. Well, if you've struggled with that, then hear this morning that God struggles with it too. In fact, he hates it. He will deal with it. And so please trust us when we say, look at Jesus, not us. Look at him. He is the one who always gets it right. We are just trying to point to him. All he does then is invite us. And he says in those wonderful words from Matthew 11, come to me all you who labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. That early church that we've looked at this morning, the real deal, spirit-filled community, had come to that same Jesus that made that offer, and were learning from him. And whoever we are, wherever we are on the hypocrisy scale, Jesus says, we can do the same today. So should we take a few moments of quiet, perhaps come to Jesus in your own hearts and minds, maybe that we need to confess sin, um, maybe we just come to him and thank him. Let's have a moment of quiet and I'll lead us in prayer.
So, Lord Jesus, we thank you this morning that you are the friend of sinners, that whoever we are, whatever we've done, um, you welcome us when we come to you humbly and repentantly. Lord, keep us even from the ironic hypocrisy of judging Ananias and Sapphira this morning. Um, thank you for the reminder of the seriousness of hypocrisy. And we ask for the gift of your Holy Spirit to pour out on us this morning that we might be rid of that. And that we as individuals in a church might increasingly be the real deal, spirit-filled community. Uh, that we might indeed be united. That we might have radical attitudes to our stuff. And that we might be willing to live sacrificially for your glory and for your honour. That we might be good witnesses to you in this place. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And we're going to come to a time of communion. Um, and so there's some words that will come up on the screen right now that we're going to say together. Thank you. We say it together then. Thank you, Father, for forgiveness. We come to your table as your children, not presuming but assured, not trusting ourselves but your word. We hunger and thirst for righteousness and ask for our hearts to be satisfied with the spiritual food of the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ the righteous. Amen. For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever we, you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And so draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Right now, as we come to take communion, the way that we'll do this, just right now we're still doing it in a very COVID-safe sort of way. And so you can stay where you are. Um, we'll bring the bread to you. I'll be taking the wine on behalf of all of us. Um, and then um, Tim will, will help me. And so we'll bring the bread to you. Um, put your hands out in front of you if you want to receive communion. If you don't, simply keep your hands to yourself. Okay. And if you need a wheat free option, please just mention it.
Right now we're going to continue in worship. If you've got a child that's age seven or under, so that they're on Ruth's crew, you'll need to collect them right now. Um, but let's stand and respond to what we've heard um, with the sermon, to what we've considered with communion. Let's respond now with worship. Let's go for it. And I will offer up my life in spirit and truth, pouring out the oil. Surrender, I must give my every part. Lord, receive the sacrifice of a broken heart. Jesus, what can I give? What can I bring to so faithful a friend, to so loving?
as we come to the end of our service. Let me pray a prayer of blessing. May the Father from whom every family in earth and heaven receives its name strengthen you with his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Glad you could be here today. Hope to see you back here next week. Don't know if there's any tea or coffee left. If so, help yourself, and we'll see you soon.